and welcome. This is the Football Hipsters podcast. You are tuned to three people who, quite frankly, should be doing more with their lives. But luckily for you, we're not. And we cover all things European football, from a nice week for Nice to Cristiano finding his mojo. We'll cover it all. It's this week's Football Hipsters podcast. Hello and welcome to the Football Hipsters podcast. I am your host, Chris. And as I mentioned in the intro, uh, we're back once again because we entertain you because we have nothing better to do. That's almost like a tagline, isn't it? I'm going to adopt that. No, genuinely, we love being here. Um, But I have to say straight off the bat, we are not four. We are three once again. Um, However, Drew's here. Hi, Drew. Hello. I did you first. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. That's disgusting. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and Tom's here. Hi, Tom. Hello. Happy Halloween. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, I hate just, it too. Don't just worry. Just because the Americans on, we have to go all, all Halloween. <laughs> uh, spooky oh, greetings to everyone listening. Um, yes, we we haven't got John um, because he had uh, a rather unfortunate incident with a man in a mask and a chainsaw. Um, so he's not able to join us tonight. He's uh, in, in code. That is, he's poorly. So get well soon, John. He will be back soon. And while you're away, John, I will butcher Serie A for you within an inch of its life. Uh, Your your segment is safe in my hands. Right then, gents, shall we crack on? We're going to start in Italy this week, actually. So I'll uh, I'll get it over and done with. Uh, I'm going to cross over and pass the reins to Tom as I cover for John. It's this week's Serie A. Okay, Serie A, my favourite league in the whole... Yeah, okay. Um, Juve started off pretty well, didn't they? In the weekend match, or you could say the best best game of the weekend, the marquee game. Chris, tell us more. Yes, I can tell you more. Well, hot off of a midweek game, they uh, beat Sampdoria by four goals to one in midweek. We'll touch on the midweek results in a second. But mm. off the back of that 4-1 victory, uh, which was fairly comfortable midweek, they faced Napoli, um, who you might be familiar with uh, as probably the closest rival for the championship this season, uh, depending on where you sit with Milan and a resurgent Lazio. But realistically, Napoli are the main challengers. But as Drew will know, they lost uh, a certain centre forward by the name of Arcadius Milik to an ACL injury a few weeks ago and they haven't quite looked the same since they were deploying Dries Mertens through the middle and I think it it will work to a certain extent Um, I'm sure Drew you're either sort of shaking your head or or nodding along but he has played there briefly in in his youth but I'm not convinced it will work long term so they're kind of experimenting with that and um, unfortunately it didn't work in this game because Juve ran out 2-1 victors. Uh, it's, it's a really, really big, important victory, I, this for Juventus, I think. Um, Tom, have a guess who got the winner. Was it Higuain? Oh, it was. Who, who'd, <laughs> who'd ever have seen that coming? It actually was It was a very, very good goal to open the scoring, actually. Leonardo Bonucci uh, spinning on a sixpence and, and thrashing home like a centre-forward, to be honest, just inside the box on uh, 50 minutes. But just four minutes later, one of your boys, Tom, Jose Callejon, um, oh. in his um, small boys shirt, uh, got got clean through on goal, took a lovely finish, actually. Back post, hit it on the volley. I forget who it was that clipped the ball through to him. It was a lovely sort of pass over the top and across the box and in snuck Callihan at the back stick and and uh, fired past Buffon. So just four minutes later, 1-1 and all was looking good. But then, as you uh, rightly uh, identified there, Tom, up popped the chunky man, uh, Gonzalo McQueen. And uh, yeah, there he was to... Uh, to pounce after uh, a little bit of poor defending has to be said from Napoli. It didn't really look convincing trying to get the ball away. Ball fell to Higuain and he does what he does best. Uh, edge of the box, rifle it bottom corner. And Juventus claimed the points. I think it, it was a good game of football. It was very, it, it was very, very stodgy first half, but admirable defending. Both teams really, really well set up. It wasn't much of a spectacle in truth. Second half got a lot better and once the goal went in, it it opened things up. But unfortunately for the neutrals, um, 
it would kind of appear that Juventus are starting to look into that ominous form that they uh, they so regularly do at this time of the season. It's a real blow for Napoli, but they, they were chinks in the armour. But unfortunately, Napoli, no points and uh, Juve stay top. I should also mention that in the midweek fixtures as well, uh, Napoli were in action. Uh, they got, for memory, a 1-0, uh, sorry, a 2-0 victory over Empoli. So uh, not all bad, but certainly didn't end the week well. Yes, no, very interesting. I'm sure it's a great game to watch. Um, well, now we move on to Lazio, who are doing reasonably, well, reasonably very well this season, it has to be said. And they played a, a Sassuolo team who, uh, I want to say sassy in their form, just for, the, just for the pun, but it doesn't really work. They're not great, though, are they? How did they get on that pair? Yeah, they're, they're not great. Uh, Nero Verdi is, is, is not having a good time. More on them in a second. Lazio came off the back of a, also like Juventus, a 4-1 victory in midweek. They beat Cagliari 4-1 in the midweek fixtures. And Sass lost at home to Roma by three goals to one. So um, teams coming in at very sort of different ends of the spectrum form-wise. And Lazio took the points in this one with a 2-1 victory. As you rightly say, Lazio are, are quietly looking quite impressive, I think. Um, Chiro Immobile, who kind of the forgotten man. Uh, Drew, he was at um, Dortmund, wasn't Dortmund. he, briefly? And, uh, and was it Sevilla? In, in yep, Italy? Sevilla. There you go, memory. Um, but um, he, he was lost, I think it's fair to say, at both clubs. But he's come back to Italy. He, he looks refreshed. He looks good for for Italy in, in the national side and he, and he looks equally at home back in the in the Lazio side and uh, and Lazio did deserve this this victory Mobile himself uh, got the um, got the, the what proved to be the second winning goal after Lulic had put Lazio in front it was actually three goals in seven minutes Defrel uh, got one back for Sass uh, it was 2-0 and then he got one back two minutes later but it wasn't enough and um, I say Lazio looking impressive um, they are currently fourth in Serie A six points off the lead but looking pretty tidy a plus plus 10 goal difference they're, they're looking pretty decent defensively uh, they've scored 22 conceded 12 so i mean it's it's a pretty decent average for them and um i think if you just had to Lazio, you'd improve this much at this stage of the season they'd have quite happily taken it but sasuolo i uh, you, you know when you get that was it the curse of the uh, europa league i wonder i just wonder if that's what the issue is um I mean, they're really, really struggling, Sass, and I know John won't be happy about this because, um, you know, if they were to tumble down, then we wouldn't be able to sing that song. But they're, they're, they're flirting at the moment with the, the bottom end. They're 16th, 13 points, and three mm. defeats from their last five, two defeats on the spin. It's not looking great for Nero Verdi, but they've got, I think they've got enough good players to, to, to pull themselves out of this, but I think they might have to exit the Europa League if they are to, uh, to get back on track, sadly. So it's one or the other for me. Mm, missing a certain Nicolas Sansone, I would assume, yeah, isn't helping them at the moment. Yes, yeah. very good player, doing very well at Villarreal this season. And uh, finally, your last game to go into Samp Inter. Now, I know you and John are rather a uh, bit of fans of, of Inter. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm breaking it to you gently. They didn't do too well, did they? No, uh, our good friend Jimmy and Anguna check out his blogs, people. Um, he's also a big Inter fan. And I think he's as sick of them as me and John are. Um, I watched this game and Inter were poor again now one thing that has to be said they, they had enough chances to win this game uh, they really did but that said i have to say sam probably just about on, on the overall deserve the points on the balance of play at the morassi they are usually pretty decent at home they lost the, the derby de lanterna uh, of course last weekend and um as we said lost juventus in midweek inter came off the back of the 2-1 victory over over uh, as we how have to call them joe hart's torino um but uh, a late icardi goal with the winner in midweek there but Unfortunately, yeah, it, it's back to Inter again. They are just the most bipolar club in Europe this season. They really are. There's it, there's so many things wrong with Inter. I don't even know where to start. I do get the feeling, um, and Drew, I might have to get your thoughts on this in a, in a second very quickly. Uh, Frank de Boer at, at Ajax. What what was his what was his setup at Ajax? I mean, do you think he's trying to do too much of the Ajax model at Inter? Do you think that he was just an overrated manager because Ajax should be winning the league? I know it's painful for you to talk about Ajax, but what what do you think his style is as a manager? I think he is always going to be a bit overrated. I think he needs the right setup to really flourish. I think at Ajax it gives him that. You know, Dutch clubs always rely on blooding the youth. They rely on sort of young, ambitious 
technically gifted players and, and that's what they roll with and every Dutch club in that regard is more or less the same you know they'll they'll buy one or two players who can come in and fill a role and they won't be you know between the ages of you know 19 or 24 and such but that's how most Dutch clubs work and you know Ajax is the best set up for that um, historically and currently even though they didn't win the league the last two years PSV did but it was always going to be an easy, easier job at IX because really, you know, every year they finish first or second, you know, and even though everyone's on the same page in regards to what they look for moving forward to set up the club for longevity in that regard, IX always has, they always can bring in the best talent in the Netherlands. They can always bring in very good foreign players, you know, especially they focus on a lot of times East European players, East European players especially, but at Inter, it's going to be different. You know, I'm not the most knowledgeable on the way Inter is set up. But for me, the way, whenever I watch Italian football, it, it just seems like teams who are the way De Boer likes to play, they can defend that very well. De Boer like to do quick, incisive, you know, penetrative football, you know, quick wingers. Um, he relied on goals from the wings as well. He didn't just rely on the center forward. You know, these are the kind of things that you would see in, for me, I just feel like if you look at how one of our all of all our favorites, Dennis Perkamp, how he struggled in the Netherlands. I mean, I'm sorry, in, in Italy, and he was an attacking player. You kind of see a lot of Italian, a lot of Dutch players who are attacking players who go to Italy. They struggle a lot because you can be technically gifted, but if you can't really handle how physical the Italian league can be, how well the defenses are set up from either a player standpoint or a managerial standpoint, you're, you're always going to struggle. And it's his first year, so it's going to be a big adjustment. But, you know, he went from having the premiere set up with him in the Netherlands and having a very, very good talent pool of players to a setup in Inter who have gone a little bit by the wayside over the last, you know, four or five years. They aren't in a premier position. He has to sort of rebuild the side, and I don't know if Inter are going to be able to play the kind of football that he wants to play. So, and he, he's very much, you know, it's got his it's his way or the highway, kind of like, like Louis van Gaal in that same fashion. That's a kind of a Dutch trait, for better or worse. Uh, mostly worse lately. So, because he hasn't adapted to Italian football, at least I feel like from what I have seen, very little of it, you know, and he might not have the right players for his system just yet. You can speak more of that if you, if you really want to, but I... I didn't really expect him to come in and transform into and also make them, you know, a challenger for, you know, the Scudetto, but um, he would need two or three years to really get it to the way he wanted it to be. But I think it's just a club that wouldn't really give him that. They have their way. They want to do things as well. The fans have expectations as well. So it's kind of, you know, there's not really an exchange of ideas in that regard. So I don't know if he'll really survive. I'll be shocked if he's there next year, honestly. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, and um, summed up pretty much everything I wanted to say. Um, and just briefly going back to the match, I mean, as I say, Icardi missed a couple of decent chances, Perisic a couple of chances. It, it just it, something doesn't look right, um, and some, it, it seems like a bad fit. I think there was quotes coming out of the intermedia in the week that um, that De Boer was no longer the manager; they just hadn't told him yet, and there's was, was all sorts of smoke. And I think there's a bit of fire here. And, at the time of recording, he's still the inter manager. If he is in a week's time, I'll be surprised. If I'm honest, I, I just don't think this one is going to end well. So uh, yeah, a one nil defeat for Inter. Credit Samp. Um, they needed this this win as much as as Inter needed uh, needed to get a good result. To be honest, um, and they're up to twelfth. So yeah, good result. But um, yeah, I, th- I think uh, John might have some news for us uh, for next week when we come to record. And back to you, Tom. Oh, back to me. Yes, sorry, out of nowhere. <laughs> no, I completely forgot about my job. Then that's fine. Um, rest of the fixtures, then. I'm sure you've got midweek ones as well um, to cover. Yeah, just very briefly. I won't go through the scorers, but midweek uh, we saw uh, Genoa beat Milan three 0 So it's a bit of an after Lord Mayor's show for Milan after beating Juventus. And uh, if you haven't seen it already, do look up uh, Gabriel Paletta sending off. It is hilarious for all the wrong reasons. Um, also, Kiev Bologna drew one one. Fiorentina drew with Crotone one one. Good point that for Crotone. Uh, Juve and Inter we've mentioned. Lazio we've mentioned. Napoli we've mentioned. Pescara losing at home to Atalanta. Sassuolo Roma we've mentioned. And Palermo 
Carlo losing at home to Udinese. Uh, then the other results from the weekend's games. Bologna lost to Fiorentina at home. A Nikola Kalinic penalty sealing the points for Laviola. Uh, that's a good result for them in the early game. Juventus Napoli, of course, the evening game. On the Sunday fixtures, Atalanta Genoa 3-0 victory for Atalanta. Goals there from Gomez and two from Kurtic. Crotone winning again. Look at that. After a midweek point away, they get two, three points Sorry, at home. 2-0 victory over Chievo. A Falcine... Falcinelli and Marcello Trotter, who Fulham fans might or might not remember. Uh, he got the second. Empoli nil, Roma nil. Quite how that ended nil nil is beyond me. Uh, Lazio Sass we've covered. Milan beat Pescara 1 0, Ventura with the winner. Uh, and in tonight's game, at time of recording, is just finished uh, Udinese 2, Torino 2. Sorry, Joe Hart's Torino 2. I can give you the table if you like. Sure, why not? I'll give it to you. Uh, right. Oh, don't so, say that. <laughs> hey, Juventus are top. Shock. 27 points from their 11 games played. Uh, four wins from the last five. Roma up to second. Uh, Milan third. Lazio fourth. Napoli fifth. That's uh, pretty much a, a, a big lineup of the top clubs there. Missing one, uh, of course, Inter. Uh, Atalanta, Fiorentina, Torino, Genoa and Chievo make up the top 10. Inter sitting 11th now. Samp up to 12th. Udinese with their, their point tonight actually go level on 12th on 14 points down at the bottom Crotone are still bottom but a win and a draw for the last two gives them hope five points Palermo playing later on tonight uh, they have six points at time of recording and Empoli just above them with Pescara also just outside the relegation zone there's a bit of a gap six points uh, to uh, Sassuolo in 16th Bologna Cagliari Udinese leading up the table um, I tried to find a game to uh, to, to give you for mm. next week because I was trying to trying to read John's mind as to as to what he might go for. Um, I really don't know who he's going to go for. I, shall I just pick the one I go for? Yeah. Mm, um, Napoli Lazio. I, <laughs> I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it's the obvious one to pick out. It's a seven forty five on Saturday. Um, the only other game that I was a bit torn on was uh, Fiorentina Samp which might be quite a tasty one at five o'clock on Sunday. But no, I'll stick with uh, Napoli Lazio. OK, right. Well, I guess it's uh, unless you've got any news, is there Florenzi news. There is, yeah, just very briefly, Alessandro Florenzi um, in the news this week, because unfortunately he is facing six months out. Uh, the old ACL, arterial cruciate ligament injury, um, 85th minute cruel blow after their 3-1 victory at SAS. Um, and it's confirmed on his left knee. So it looks like he's going to be missing a large chunk of the season. One of John and I's favourites. Um, bad news for him. Let's, uh, let's hope he can come back strong because he's it's been fantastic um, the last past few years. And um, we wish him all the best in his recovery. But other than that, I could find no other news. OK, mate. Well, I guess that concludes Serie A. Back to you. Indeed. Right, let's move on. Um, and I'm going to swing it right back to you because we're going to see what's been going on in Spain. And it's back to you for this week's La Liga. OK, let's start with Alaves, who um, they caused all sorts of um, all sorts of fun and games, didn't they, at the new Camp earlier on this mm. season. Same can't be said when they hosted Real Madrid this weekend, though. No, although it did start off positively for them. Um, they went one new up again. That man, Davison, scoring again against one of the Jim. big boys, obviously. Yes, yes, Jim Davison. <laughs> that <laughs> Don't would know. be a story, wouldn't it? The, the Brazilian bald-headed man scored again against one of the top sides. Obviously, he got the goal against uh, Barcelona at the new Camp. And he opened the scoring seven minutes in after converting Hernandez's cross. Uh, but then the Ronaldo show sort of started um, at 1 1. It came from a penalty which is very, very dubious. And it is Davison actually concedes it. He's in the wall for a Barrett Bell free kicks and raises his arm uh, to put it up. And the ref blows for a penalty. It's it's contentious. And you have to say sometimes, I feel anyway, that if there's doubt in the mind of, ref- of the referee, I don't think he should give it. Um, but he did. And, and Ronaldo converted. And uh, Ronaldo then scored again. It was a deflected a shot off Fidel from outside the box that, that took it over the keeper of Alaves to make it 2-1. That was on the 33 minutes. And then he missed the penalty in, in the second half. Uh, after I, th- uh, I can't remember who, exactly who it was. He brought, brought whoever it was down, but he missed the resulting penalty. I'm sure he doesn't want to know too much about it. And then Alvaro Morata got the, uh, the third goal for Real Madrid after a brilliant long field ball from Marcelo across the pitch. 
And Morata does that little thing where it bounces up just enough for him to do a little tap to chip it over the keeper. Pirez style against Aston Villa, I think it was. Oh, what a goal. Um, but anyway, Cristiano Ronaldo then got his hat-trick in the 88th minute. Marcelo and him played some great interplay on the left-hand side before just tapping it to his right before slamming it past Fernandes, the goalkeeper. To make it 4-1, it's another convincing win for Real Madrid, who was the top of the league, and uh, it should be one they win anyway. But as we approach El Clasico, uh, they want to keep that winning run going. El Clasico on the horizon. How soon is that away, by the way? Is it quite, uh, quite a soon? A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks away. Yeah. Good. I'll look Not forward on to UK TV. I was just going to say, I'll look forward yeah. to watching. Oh, wait, hang on. Yeah. Maybe I won't. So, <laughs> I shall watch it on my popular um, gambling website. <coughs> Yeah. Moving on. Uh, OK, so a win for Real Madrid. Just quickly, before we leave Real Madrid, mm. uh, a new contract for a Welshman. Yes, Bale signed a new deal until 2022, I believe. And the reported weekly fee is £350,000 a week after tax, which boils down to £34 a minute. That's that's a lot of uh, skittles, I have to say, a lot of skittles. So he's on nearly as much as I am per podcast. That's impressive. Good. Yeah, I know. Um, I, actually, to be fair, I take thirty four fifty podcasts. I don't know about you guys, but I take that. So <laughs> anyone who's anyone who's listening out there that wants to, uh, I don't know, some razor company or somebody that wants to pay us, that, that's fine. Just let us know. We'll, we'll deal <laughs> There's with it. Plenty out there. We'll, we'll sell ourselves. It's, it's fine. A razor um, company, sound casting company. Oh, yeah, we'll have them all. We'll have betting them all. We'll, company. <laughs> we'll do, we'll do Go them all. on. <laughs> shameless, shameless. We'll plug something actually later on. Come back to that. Um, right, Atletico Madrid. Um, so obviously Real Madrid winning. Atletico yes. needed to win. Um, I presume they won one 0 and it was really boring then. Yeah, no, one nil Griezmann. Uh, yeah, no, no, it wasn't. It was a what? six goal thriller again. Another massive scoreline from from Atletico after their obviously stop. their uh, their loss against Sevilla in in the previous week. But uh, it's your man, Chris, Mister Yannick Carrasco, and to be fair, your other man, your previous L'Oreal striker, you cry about losing every single night, Kevin Gamero. Both boys. got braces. Yes, exactly. And Carrasco was certainly the bookends of the game, scoring the first and last goal. But his opening goal in the seventh minute, he's got this knack of finishing across the keeper, low into the corner. I, and a very painful memory of him against Monaco for uh, against Arsenal is uh, just stick in my mind of that case as well. And uh, another assist for Griezmann, who, who got two in this game, set up Carrasco. And then Kevin Gamero got uh, got the uh, second on 24 minutes after awful defending from Malaga in the box. And then Sandra Ramirez, the uh, on. on He's not even on loan anymore. He's, he's been sold to Malaga from Barcelona for a few about around eight million pounds ish. I'm pretty sure the price is slammed in a free kick at a ridiculous angle uh, over O Black, and the, 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 the Slovenian goalkeeper was helpless. But then Gamero just before half time made it three one to Atletico. Great little a dink of a header from Griezmann set him up, and he slammed home on the near post. And then the second half, Malaga got themselves back in the game with 64 minutes, and Ignacio Camacho scoring again. He's he's becoming a bit of a habit of this uh, header from a corner from Cash. Uh, that made it 3-2 and then the 86th minute Carrasco killed the game ball was played across the halfway line Carrasco's paces I really didn't think he was quick as he seemingly is but he is rapid and he ran onto that pass from Correa with ease and Dan slotted it past um, the keeper was Kameni the old uh, I think he's an Espanol keeper in the past in fact actually and uh, and made it 4-2 which got them the points but Atletico seemingly aren't the boring 1-0 or 0-0 or we'll play for a draw side they are scoring in droves recently and uh, definitely people are saying they're favourites for the title do you think, just quickly, that this new hybrid Atletico, do you think it's as a result of uh, Big Cholo saying that he, I mean, let's be honest, he's essentially saying he's going to be off sooner than expected. Um, I do hmm. wonder what might happen if Frank de Boer does go. I mean, I don't think he's going to leave mid-season, but I wonder if they might get somebody in short term, you know, just to sort of tide it over till Simeone comes inevitably back to Inter. Do you think it's because, do you think he's throwing the shackles off a bit? Because, not because he doesn't care, but because mm. he sort of knows he has plans to go elsewhere at some point? Oh, it's, it's, it's a good point, and I'm not, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure of the answer. I mean, if it was just a guess, I'd I wouldn't say he deviate too much from his typical style. He has said in the past that he's always keen on on playing attacking football, and he doesn't want to be brandished with this physical defensive style of play. And that he he knows that he is a manager who can play some attractive football, which is definitely showing. But is he just doing it to time over? Maybe. But if he's going to go for the title, this is definitely a great season to do that with the the dodgy results we've seen of the other teams so far this season. 
Yeah, it's one to keep an eye on that because I think, as you say, he's branded defensive, but this season seems to be a bit different. Um, now, defensive was not the word to use when we talk about Celta, uh, Celta Vigo, and Las <laughs> Palmas. Definitely, mm. definitely not. Um, this one was a bit of a thriller, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, and it echoes of the Espanyol game uh, last week, which was another amazing scoreline. Thank Christ we got that back. But no, um, Celta Vigo uh, playing actually. I'm sorry, Chris. I said to you before that Celta were at home and I've got that mixed up because Las Palmas were at home uh, in the Canary Islands down the African coast. And Celta Vigo went 3-0 up in the first half. Uh, Daniel Vass, the Danish midfielder, slammed in a free kick. Uh, which was actually rather powerful, and, and you, I don't blame Las Palmas goalkeeper for not saving it. Iago Aspas, the man who is totally informed, the man forgotten from Liverpool those years ago, is now smashing it. The Spanish forwards uh, got a, a brilliant chip to finish after Sisto, the uh, Midland winger was that was bought in the summer, played him in. And then the little Spanish striker got another goal from Oriana's pass to make it three before half-time. Second half rolled around, though, and Las Palmas decided to wake up. Big ass, your favourite player, Chris, um, the, the central defender, getting a flicked header off a free kick into the goal. Really quite one of those ones that you just get a flick and the keeper's in no man's land. And then uh, Jonathan Vieira uh, scored a penalty, which was uh, quite fortunate seeing as El Vigo's centre-back, Sergio Garcia, got sent off as well. And that led the way for Las Palmas to come away with the point after Kevin Prince Boateng, two minutes after the penalty was scored, was laid across by Michelle after some fantastic passing. And you know how good they are passing from their goal against Villarreal. And, uh, and the Ghanaian uh, ex Schalke centre attacking midfielder scored again, his fourth for the season, to make it 3 3. And they couldn't get a goal in the remaining 22 minutes to get all three points. But. Uh, I'm, I'm still looking at them as like, I hope they can progress and get some more winning results because of their last four, last five games, they've drawn four and, one and lost one. So the wins are a bit sparse, but hopefully they can get that back. Cracking game, just mm. bonkers, bonkers game. And the red card, I guess, probably turned it. But yeah, just a nuts, mm. nuts game of football and, um, and fun for the neutral. Um, right, where did that leave all the other clubs playing this weekend? How did they get on? Yeah, it wasn't a massive uh, free-flying scoring like the other uh, other few weeks it has been, but there's still quite a fair few goals. Uh, Real Sociedad came away from Leganes, who I think are really slipping now, considering the psychological boost and some early wins has slipped away. Real Sociedad's goal scorers, Chabi Pareto and William Jose, getting the goals to push them up the league. Sporting Hijon, who have been really struggling this season, came away with an extremely well-earned point at home to Sevilla, the supposed title challengers. Uh, Luciano Vieto scored a fourth-minute goal to put Sevilla up, and then my favourite player on their team at the moment, Moy Gomez, who I really do highly rate, and he's had a bit of trouble in his career, but he got the equaliser in 20 minutes in, and that's how it played out. Barcelona, the, playing Granada in the new camp, you would say darn sure this would be full of goals but they struggled and only came away with a 1-0 win. Rafinha, the Brazilian man who seemingly will replace Iniesta when he retires, scored an over a kick instinctively to give the Catalonians a 1-0 win. Ibar came away with another impressive result actually 2-1 at home to Villarreal uh, Bruno scored a penalty kick to put the, uh, the, the yellow submarine 1-0 up but Ibar's men in the 80th minute and beyond, Ramis, the ex the ex Wigan centre-back uh, scored and Pedro Leon got the ex-Real Madrid player, got an 87th minute winner to push the uh, the Basque side up the table. Athletic Club Bilbao, unfortunately, couldn't get all three points, though. Their best counterparts playing against Osasuna. Uh, the Osasunian team... Osasunian? Is that a word? I don't know. I've created it and it I like now. it. Oriel Riera got the first goal in 23 minutes and Raul Garcia five minutes later got the equaliser for Bilbao and Real Betis lost to Espanyol! We won a game! We actually won a game. Diego Reyes getting a goal, and to be fair, was it fair? It wasn't fair. We should not have won that game, but we did. Three points, lovely job. And now at the moment, De- Deportivo, as we are recording, a play in Valencia, and it's currently nil-nil as far as I can see, unless a goal sneaked in, but I don't think it has. And it I'll keep nil-nil. you up to date. It is nil-nil, so it I'll keep that up to date as we go on. I don't think it'll finish by the time we finish, but uh, no, that's how it is at the moment. Good stuff, good stuff. So where are we table-wise after the weekend's action? Yeah, table-wise, it's uh, it's still five five points uh, which are maintaining the top five, and that's Real Madrid at the top, twenty four points, seven ga- uh, ten games played, seven wins. Barcelona are second, two points behind uh, on twenty two. On third place, Atletico keeping pace, three points behind the leaders on twenty one. Fourth place, Sevilla dropped after the draw away at Sporting Gijón, also on twenty one points. Then Atletico and Villarreal are now fifth and remain fifth in nineteenth. But uh, Real Sociedad are up to sixth. 
on 16 points. There's a gap forming now between the top five and, and, and lower down of three points, but it is starting to form. And down at the bottom, Granada still three points. Osasuna with that point have pushed up to seven points in 19th. Deportivo playing right now, waiting to see how they do. Sport he on that point pushed them up to 17th, obviously with the caveat of Deportivo playing right at the moment on nine points. Valencia, as I said, still playing now on nine points. And Leganes are 15th, gone down the table as well as Alaves, both on 10 points. Good times, good times. And you'll be happy to know a, a former man of La Liga has just helped set up a Swansea goal, Diego Lur- uh, uh, Fernando Lorente. Fernando Lorente, yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, good times. Okay. Uh, what game are you going to keep an eye on next week? Uh, I'm going to cheat, and there's two. I'm sorry. Um, but Real Sociedad have been performing really well recently at uh, home to Atletico Madrid, so that's going to be interesting to see what happens there. And then in, on the Sunday, 7.45 kickoff, Sky Sports 1, Sevilla against Barcelona. Uh, a very important game for Sevilla if they were to be considered title challengers. And seeing as they came away of a win against Atletico Madrid in the uh, P- uh, Sante Pichuan, um, it will be interesting to see what the result is there. Mm, cheating but we'll we'll let it pass on this one (laughs) fair enough okay right well that uh, wraps us up in spain for another week and uh, of course next week was it last week for the next international ball off isn't it so we'll uh, we'll be across next week's action as well this time in a week's time right let's move on to germany next and see what drew has got for us it's this week's bundesliga Okay then, Drew. Uh, We couldn't start anywhere else but the Riviera Derby between Borussia Dortmund and Schalke. I'm sure it was packed with goals, incidents, cards, drama, uh, or not. Well, cards, yes. Goals, no. Um, And did no, no. Um, Personally, you would... Be, it'd be difficult to find any Dortmund supporter who was actually happy with that result. Um, I could hear the excitement in your voice. I'm, I'm like, I'm dreading talking about this just because I'm still <laughs> like a little bit grumpy about it. Um, <clears throat> I know Dortmund's had their struggles this season, despite how well we performed last year. But you know, three draws on the spin at the moment after you know dropping the full three points away at Leverkusen, so we have winless in our last four matches. That's very, very disappointing considering you know they they did lose Hummels. Um, to win, you know, but even with those players out of the team now, I think Dortmund still has the playing personnel to really still be the front runner for second place. But the issue for me now is my problem with this match is that Tuchel really got the 11 wrong. So he went with a 4 1 4 1, which is, and it transitions to a 4 3 3, which is. Oh, you'd expect, but he went with Gota and Kagawa in midfield ahead of Weigel. That, for me, is one of the issues. So, you know, when you're at home against a rival, you kind of want to control proceedings. And, you know, Gota and Kagawa are excellent at controlling the match, slowing things down, picking up the pace when you need to. But the issue then is there's no there's no fight, there's no grit in midfield. And when, you know, Vinegel deploys Goretzka, Bentaleb, and Johannes Geis in the midfield three, you're always going to lose the majority of aerial challenges. You're, you know, Schalke is going to be a bit better in the tackle than you are, more physical. You know, we Dortmund was careless with possession more frequently, so it just wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't the the high flying Dortmund you really wanted to see. That we want more with possession, um, control, and tempo than than really sort of hitting Schalke hard and quickly. You know, and when they're only playing three at the back. You know, they had uh, Alessandro Schopf and um, said Kolasinic on either flank um, in because uh, uh, Vanzo was a 3-5-2. So you'd really expect, you know, Pulisic and Dembele, who started, to get down those flanks and really threaten and really maybe create a little bit more space for Obama. And it just didn't really happen. Um, it's diff, diff, you know, disappointing performance. Again, Schalke will take the point because I think now they, yeah, the two wins, two draws in their last four matches. So they're actually in form after that really poor start. So, you know, they'll take it. Dortmund is struggling at the moment. You know, it's the first time they haven't, I'm sorry, the second time all season they haven't scored. Um, but 
you know, not too worried yet, but I do expect better in a rivalry match. And, you know, some of the players also said as such in, in the post-match comments, especially Pool Sissu, so saying that this just wasn't, you know, an acceptable result. You know, given the fact that right now, you know, Hertha, Köln, Hoffenheim, and Derby Leipzig are all overperforming, you know, Dortmund are sitting tied for six on points with Eintracht Frankfurt, and that's not what you really wanted to see. And they're already eight points back of Bayern. Nine matches in, that's the last thing you ever want. You know, Bayern's tough to catch if you can catch them at all. So right now it looks like we're not going to. Yeah, two, uh, two, well, one observation and one very brief question for you. The yeah. observation, uh, I love how laid back Marcus Weinzel is uh, mm-hmm. on the bench. He like sits, he literally, it's not, it's no good for his posture. He just slouches, <laughs> doesn't he? Yeah. His seat. He's just like, looks like the most chilled man in the world. He's um, pulling the Wenger, but Wenger at least has better posture. Yeah, that's true. Actually, Wenger does do it as well, uh, and, and he he struggles to find his pockets, of course. Yes. Um, but also, <laughs> just very briefly before we move on to the next game with Dortmund, you said you're not worried. Is it? Do you feel like I don't know? Do you feel like they're stuck in the wrong gear at the moment? They, I don't know what it is, but they just don't seem. You know, like you expect the Dortmunds of the past, free flowing and counter attacking football, bombing on at pace. They seem a little bit like checky if you know what i mean they check back each time and there doesn't seem to be freedom of expression this season is that a bit of a worry it's only a worry until it gets fixed i think it'll it'll fix itself i think the actual issue is that i think vangel's i think he can be accused of tinkering a little too much like i said you know he wanted to be a little bit more technically clever so he went with two smaller creative players in the middle behind obamian who could control things and it's one thing to control a match, but then when you it, you still need that ability to to bring a different direction if you need to. You need to be a little more physical when you can. You know, Sebastian Roda was on the bench. You know, he would have been excellent in this match. Honestly, he could have gone up against the likes of you know Bentaleb and Goretzka because those are two very very good physical box to box midfielders. And then you have guys who is deeper than them, equally as physical, but he can pull the strings and Schalke are capable of hitting you on the break. And those three players the middle especially they rely on that they they work hard they all have engines you know so i think he needed to mix and match a little bit better instead of doing what he wanted rather than what maybe the match needed you know i was fine with obviously dembele getting the start you know pulisic played so they could rotate instead of you know rafa guerrero or andre schiller they were both on the bench they both came off the bench but you may have seen in another match you would have seen guerrero on the left and dembele on the right so the rotation is there but i think now that he has so many options Tuchel, I think he's he feels like he needs to rotate often, and that might be an issue because you can you really can't get consistency when you have a different eleven every match unless you're the likes of you know the Bayerns and the and the Barces, whoever have you. So, um, and also, I feel like since he bought Goza, he feels like he's forced to play Goza, and I don't think that's how it should work. You know, and it's not because it's a negative bias because he left, but the fact is that. It's really going to be difficult to to really have both Gota and Kagawa play in the same midfield when they're identical players. So for me, I think you need a little bit different maybe approach, not just this match, but all the other matches you know throughout the season. So we'll see how it goes from there. There's still plenty of time, but like I said, you don't want to be eight points adrift of Bayern already nine matches in. That's not how your season should be going if you're you know hoping to close the gap a bit. Yeah, true, true. We will keep an eye. It's it's an interesting one to follow. But uh, let's move on to uh, Nagelsmann Watch, as I like to call this part of the show, <laughs> where we check in on Hoffenheim. Um, they just keep going, don't they? Another victory this weekend, a 1-0 win over Hertha, who are also flying high. Yeah, it's five in a row for Hoffenheim after those four straight draws to open the league campaign. Um, it, it was against a good Hertha side, who have proven they can still defend pretty well, but they're... Again, goals are going to be another issue, and I think we mentioned that um, not, also not just this season, but last season and also during the summer um, with the interview that, you know, it's going to be difficult to see how they're really going to be sustainable and to put themselves into a routine top four place or a European place if they just can't score goals. Um, and other than Vidal Ibisevic, he's got, what, six of the 14, and it's they don't really have another goal threat. So for me, I think that's Hertha's worry. But I think, you know, away from home against a Hoffenheim who on form are the best <laughs> side over the last five matches in the Bundesliga, even better than Bayern, I think he'll take a 1-0 away loss. Um, as for Hoffenheim, again, you know, it's basically the same thing that I said, you know, last week. Um, you really see that the tactically 
I think Nagelsmann has really found the way forward for them. You know, he's got a really strong three at the back. You know, depending who he wants to put at the midfield anchor, sometimes it's Sebastian Ruddy, sometimes it's a different option. And with that, and then you give license for, you know, uh, Steven Zuber and Kimir, uh Kerm Dimir Bay and, and, you know, Nidim Amiri and, and those types of players to go on and get forward and play in and around Sandro Wagner, who, like I said last weekend, has become a really good central focal point for Hoffenheim's attack and something that they missed last year. You know, he's just getting the maximum out of the 11 that he puts out every week, and that's really all you can expect from, you know, a side that people maybe thought would, if they finished mid-table, they would have had a good season based off of last year's results. But... They're definitely overperforming. Um, I do think it's too early to say if they will regress or not, because they do have a lot of positive signs to suggest that you know that they won't regress as much. Like I don't, again, I don't think they'll make Champions League, but you know, and by you know by the winter break, if they're still in a top five or six position, I would probably expect them to finish there, given you know they've got a lot of solidarity. There's consistency, not in just the performances, but the eleven. You know, he has faith in certain players and he's keeping faith in that and that's, that's kind of what you want from your manager and I think maybe younger managers kind of have that you know he may have a sense of loyalty that maybe other managers wouldn't but you know all that said I thought they were excellent in that match and Hertha really had a chance to really really threaten them I think it was more of how to limit the score and you know Hertha will be good at that from now and again but um, yeah it's good to see that you know maybe potentially another team might be able to spring a surprise you know, every year the Bundesliga always has one big surprise side so this year we have a couple, so we'll see how it goes. Breakout teams, yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. I, I personally, I really like Sandra Wagner. He's just a proper, he's almost like Alex Meyer, younger version. He's just, mm-hmm. just a proper old-fashioned centre forward. I really like him. So good on uh, good on Nigelsmann. And uh, yeah, we, we, you have the backing of our pod. I'm sure you're delighted to hear that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of reborn strikers, Anthony Modest. Um, who plays for Cologne or FC Cologne, whichever you prefer. Um, Bordeaux fans might remember him. Um, People in France might remember him full stop. When he played in France, he was terrible. Uh, Could not hit a cow's bottom with a banjo, to put it politely. He's gone to Cologne and he cannot stop scoring. I don't know whether he'll get the hat-trick. I don't know if it's been announced, but... The first goal was suspiciously like it went straight through, but I don't know whether it did or not. He even managed to miss a penalty, uh, but a 3-0 victory. We'll talk about Hamburg in a second because I do want to touch on them. But Modest, uh, just he's just on fire, isn't he? It's uh, 11 goals this season now. 11, yeah, 11 goals this season. He's four clear of uh, Lewandowski and Aubameyang. Uh, I don't really... You would say that it was expected for him to be up in the goal scoring charts as he was last season, but I don't think people would expect him to have this sort of goal scoring clip this early in the year. I mean, it could mean one of two things: either it's going to continue and he's going to end up, you know, being leading scorer in the season, or he will regress and then Cologne are in trouble because you know, for the 16 goals they have scored, he has 11 of those. That is a really lopsided percentage, as you know, once. The season progresses and, you know, tired legs come into play and teams hit form, especially the bigger teams. It's going to be difficult to see if Cologne can keep, if Cologne can keep that pace uh, with just one goal threat. Again, we saw that last year from Hurt that they had just um, uh, Solomon Kalu and E.B. Severich was only two scoring goals and eventually they weren't getting enough goals from other sources. And if those players had an off match, they just didn't score and didn't win. So, but I would... I, at the moment, you would have to say that Cole and I are a bit better defensively, so they have that in their favor. They've only allowed six goals. You know, Timo Horn's been excellent this season. Um, everyone at the back as well. You know, obviously you have Jonas Hector. He's also done well, but you have um, Sorensen, the Swedish international. He's done really quite well this season. So for me, I feel like I mean, you you might be able to speak of this as well, Chris. That teams in Italy always, if if they had a really strong really strong back four, a really good keeper. If they're organized, that could offset the fact that they might not be able to get a, get a lot of goals from a lot of different players. Oh, I'm sorry, also Sorensen is Danish. I completely forgot. I should be drunk and quartered. But, um, so I want to get your opinion on that. Would you feel that in a league like the Bundesliga where it is as attacking as it is and there's quality throughout the league, do you think a, a more defensively stout coincide with just one main goal threat. Do you think that's enough for them, or do you think they'll regress? I think they'll regress personally, but I wanted to get your take on it also. 
I am with you. I do think they will regret. I think, I, do you know what? As, uh, particularly in, in when you talk about like the difference the point you made there, difference between the two leagues. Like Modeste didn't didn't kick in in France um, and was you know poor. And yet, isn't it funny how so many players thrive in Germany or? you know, or it goes wrong. Like if you look, we talked about Immobile earlier on. It's funny mm. how certain players just suit certain systems. And I think like you, I think Cologne will, will regress. And I, and I worry that if Modeste stops scoring, who else gets the goals? Um, that's the biggest concern I have for a team like Cologne, who've, who've really got that one talisman. Uh, is it Rissa? I think it impresses me when I see him play a lot, but mm-hmm. they don't, really have another goal threat other than from set pieces from what I can gather and like you I, I do think this will probably be their limit but it is a crazy season so I mean I mean where are they now what's six is it uh no sorry they are higher fourth yes. um and, you know and, and they keep going and when you see teams like Hoffenheim, Hertha, Cologne, Leipzig of course you know it, it's a crazy season and I, I suppose we'll get a better viewpoint of it after christmas i guess that's when we should judge um, when things settle down but no i i'm with you i do think they'll they will regress and i and i again agree with you the attacking side of the bundesliga is what you need to embrace if you're going to perform i don't think there's many teams if you look at was it ingolstadt currently down the bottom they're quite defensive darmstadt the same um should we, should we touch on Hamburg now? I think we could, couldn't we? <laughs> I mean, we could, <laughs> I mean, but the thing is, you can't say they're defensive and they're certainly not no, good enough not. In, the, in the attacking sense. And it's not for a, a lack of a few players that can possibly you know, affect the match. You know, Nikolai Müller was a little bit better last season than he has been this year. Philip Kostic came from uh, Stuttgart, and he was absolutely excellent for them last season despite getting relegated. Um, Lewis Holtby usually is their standout performer, but you have to take it with a grain of salt because he wasn't very effective at Spurs, but then he came to the Bundesliga and then he was much more effective on his return, especially last year. And that sort of, uh, that sent it because was how I tried to explain it to people where he's in midfield, but you know, he gets for the forward, he pulls the strings. But for me, I feel one of their issues is despite the fact that I don't think they created enough quality chances that they really don't have a, an out and out striker who they can really rely on. Um, Bobby Wood, for me, you know, he did well in his debut, but apart from that, I, I, he he's way above the level he should be at. I think he still should be a Bundesliga's five player, and if he is in the Bundesliga, he needs to be at a lower end club and not a club as big as Hamburg actually are domestically. And then you have Pierre Michel Lasoga, who for me just <laughs> he's. I, 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 scored since Feb- is it February or March? One it's of the two? something absolutely ludicrous like that. He's just not the quality that Hamburg would need. And I just... I, the Two goals in nine matches, I think, sort of sums it up. But I think the bigger issue is that they've allowed 18 while only scoring twice. At least Ingolstadt in their defense have scored seven, despite surrendering 19, you know. And then you look at, you know, Werder Bremen, they've allowed 24 goals this season somehow. <laughs> But they, but because they have eleven goals, they're not sitting at the bottom. It's just, I I do think this is the season where Hamburg finally failed to avoid the drop. I think they're going to finally get. I was get just going to ask you that very. No, I, I think I think I think this is the season that they go down, and it's going to be big because again, a lot of people don't realize how big of a club Hamburg actually are. They have brilliant history, domestically and in Europe. They've had some brilliant players over the course of their. Uh, existence so it's, it's going to be a, a hit in regards to you can't even say prestige because the club has fallen and the way people view it but you know it's it's another record that sort of you know we'll have to go by the wayside now because they've you know never been relegated so yeah it's a mess it's a mess oh dear okay well what about the other results then for the weekend uh, from the bundesliga Sure. So uh, on uh, Friday, <laughs> John's not here. Oh, he's here, but he's not. So Gladbach struggle again, you know, 0-0 at home against Eintracht Frankfurt. Uh, on Saturday, Mainz were uh, 2-0 winners at home against Ingolstadt. Wolfsburg lost at home to Leverkusen 2-1. Bayern were away at Augsburg and won 3-1. Freiburg traveled to Bremen and won 3-1. RB Leipzig won 2-0 on the road at Darmstadt. And oops. And yeah, that's that, that's pretty much it. Just those, those are the matches, so. There's the results. And where do we find the table now? 
Okay, so Bayern are top on 23 points. Uh, RBL are second, two points behind on 21. Hoffenheim third on 19. Köln fourth on 18. Hertha fifth on 17. Uh, Dortmund and Eintracht are tied for sixth on... F- I'm sorry, and Freiburg are all tied for six on 15 points. Bottom of the table, Hamburg and Ingolstadt are tied on two points. Wolfsburg 16 on six. And then uh, Werder Bremen on 15th on seven. Interesting. And uh, is there a stand-up fixture for you for next week? Yeah, it's Bayern uh, play host to Hoffenheim. Oh, now that will be the Nagelsmann test. Yes, if, that'll be a good one. If he wins that game, I'm going to announce it right now on this podcast. <laughs> if Hoffenheim win that game, they have to win, not just get a point. They have to win. If they do win, we will open the Julian Nagelsmann Hall of Fame on our own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that is the, my commitment to Big Union. I'll, I will also say this. This is a long shot, but I'll put my neck out and say if they win that match, I think they'll they'll qualify for Champions League next season. Some big claims being made on this podcast. <laughs> so uh, tune in next week when Bayern Munich have won 6-0. And we're we'll look very <laughs> silly. Uh, right. Okay. Thank you to you, Drew. And uh, we will um, we'll come back to you if we've got any questions by the end of the show. Right, let's move on. And Tom, I'm going to throw right back to you then. And uh, we're going to take a trip into my neck of the woods. And it's this week's French Roundup. It's Liga. Okay, so we're back in France, and this is this has come a surprise to me, Chris, because I'm going to have to go to you and say, what game do you want to do first? Oh, can I start the gang on? Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I? Go for it, mate. Um, yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to kind of pull out some teams that, te- that maybe we don't talk about enough because there's there's a lot. Obviously, everyone wants to know how the top teams are doing, etc. But Gangop have really quietly been impressive this season and, and they're they're surprising a lot of people, I think it's fair to say. They won by a goal to nil this weekend. It was a late winner. Um, they did have to wait for it, but they did get the winner in the end against Angers uh, from a DePau, 78th minutes uh, to be exact. And that leaves them in fourth place. Three straight wins. Um, and I don't think anyone would have seen that. Uh, I, I don't really think anyone would have seen that game coming. But... Um, Oh, sorry, that, that win coming um, in this performance because they've just been really, really good and they've really impressed me. And I think for a, a club that they won the uh, they won the French Cup a couple of seasons ago, I think that was probably their biggest, well, it is their biggest achievement, let's be honest. But for, for a club with such a, a small budget, um, with some players, they've got some young, talented players, but, you know, their stadium holds 18,000. They're not a fashionable club. Um, they've got Patrick Kitts, for goodness sake. I mean, how old school is that? Um, they're, oh. they're just quietly going about their business and and they've, they've really really impressed me this season and i hope it continues because the more uh, the more sort of teams we get that, that break out of france like this and and the, some of the young players they produce uh, i think it can only be good for for french football and their manager um you might remember a certain antoine kumbare who used to manage psg um oh. a few years ago also formerly managed Lons and uh, strasbourg but um yeah he's he's a name that um, will be familiar to to french football fans and he's doing an excellent job there and i hope it continues because teams like gangomp need a, a little bit of recognition so i thought i'd do that this week's podcast and as i say up to fourth they are doing well I uh, I can pick my next game for you if you want, because I want to do St. Etienne Monaco next. Uh, and then we'll come on to Nice and on in a second. But St. Etienne Monaco, uh, I pulled this one out. I pulled it out as my highlight game probably of last week. And so it proved. Um, St. Etienne just don't lose at home to Monaco. It's been a number of years, in fact, since they last did. And this game was, was no surprise that it ended in a draw. St. Etienne are quietly imp- improving and impressing me this season. They are... They're still St Etienne, and what I mean by that is oh, anybody that listens to this regularly or watches French football will know what I mean by that. But they are quintessentially Gautier St Etienne. They're, they're just they're functional. They're if I could describe them as a fruit, they'd be an apple. 
you know they're they're in <laughs> they're in people's fruit boxes but they're not as exciting as a banana they're not as hip as a as a pineapple and they're just kind of there but they're functional and they do a good job and they fill you up so that's kind of how i describe that's a really weird metaphor but they're just they, they quietly go about their business and they have got some good players. You look at Roman Hamuma, who people will know about, um, with some Tanan, who we did last season on the um, Hipsters' Choice, Berich up top. And uh, they got some good players in midfield. Jeremy Clément, Pajot, who's still a very good player. The Aston Villa, former Aston Villa player, uh, Jeremy uh, uh, Veratu. Sorry, Jeremy Veratu. He's he's a player who's come in and done really well. Nine appearances and one goal. Jordan Veratu, sorry, giving him a wrong name there. Um, he's come in and looked good. And of course, centre backs uh, like Para actually got the equaliser in this game the skipper he just goes on and on Florentine Pogba uh, Mosue as well they're, they're kind of impressive and when you play against a side like Monaco who've been for me the best best side in France this season barring Nice of course which we'll come on to in a second I, I think it's I think it's a point game for St Etienne even though they're at home as far as Monaco goes uh, Camille Glick actually put them in front of this game. He's, he's a goal scoring machine, is Big Glick, one of John's favourites, former Torino man. But um, yeah, they're, they're still impressive, Monaco. They're, they're hard to beat, as they always have been under Leonardo Jardim, but they, they've added substance now. They've added style. They've added a bit of flair. And, and they've, if you look at their squad, they've got some real depth. Um, and I wonder, as a, obviously I've mentioned before, how far they might go in the Champions League. Um, I think that squad depth is going to really come to the fore in the coming weeks. Um, and barring any sort of major injuries and some of the young players they're producing that are coming through, I think I do still think that they could push PSG all the way, um, potentially winning Liga this season. Well, fair play. So I guess the question is, how nice are Nice? Oh, nice. Uh, nice are very nice. We love nice. Love nice. Um, no, they're brilliant. Really, really brilliant. Um, I should just say at this point, before we go on, you have a goal for Deportivo, Tom. There you go. <gasps> Valencia are bad. <laughs> just, just thought I'd let you know. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, Nice, nice are really, uh, really, really impressive. The thing that blew me away about this is they none have been poor this season. Sorry to our listener, Jan Zeb Shaheen, who will be listening to this cringing all the way, but I can't say anything as a Lorient fan. But um, no, uh, none have been poor this season. They are languishing down in 15th in Liga, but Nice absolutely just took them apart in this game. I thought it'd be a, a 1 0, maybe a, a 2 0, a 2 1 even. Um, but they, they just they just ripped into Nantes and they couldn't they just couldn't contain them. Uh, William Cyprien, who's he's got a brace on the day, he's proving to be a really, really good little young player signing uh in the summer um mario balotelli some people might have might remember him his name he got uh, got another goal and uh, and the man who i'm fast developing a, a lacazette-esque crush on ali sam player um is proving to be quite the player he got another goal uh, that's four in his last two for him and um he's racking up the goals himself and, and looks a talent and they just blew on away one goal back from salah which actually made it 2-1 at the time but then those two goals in, in five minutes from player and Cyprian wrapping up the point. So it's another another victory for Nice. It's uh, it's five straight wins for them. I mean they're just they're just tearing it up at the moment. And when you look at the table right now, Nice six points clear of Monaco and PSG. They're still unbeaten. Nine wins, two draws. Um, I can't see this run coming to an end at the moment just because they're they're on fire. Again. As we said with Sassuolo earlier on, the Europa League might prove a distraction. But as I touched on the last match I did with uh, with Ross and, and John, um, I, I'm not 100% sure Nice will be in the Europa League um, at the end of the, the group stages. So it might not be an issue. Um, they will be tested in the coming weeks. They go away to Cannes uh, next weekend, which, you know, I'd still expect them to win. They then take a trip to St Etienne. And I think that's probably going to be when we're going to start to see whether these games will catch up um, because they've got Schalke straight after St Etienne. Then they play host to Bastia the following week. The game that I know everybody's looking forward to, PSG versus Nice, 9th of December. That's one for your diaries. Certainly is. I might even have to tune in for that one to see how nice Nice are. I'm going to keep saying that over and over again. Oh, just, it's just so nice. Oh, did it again. Oh, I did it again. Oh. OK, so I guess I have to ask you how nice the rest of the fixtures were. Yes, uh, well, um, it wasn't exactly a stellar weekend in France. I've got to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, Lille, nil, PSG, one, opened up the weekend's action. Uh, a goal for Edinson Cavani um, in his standard area. Oh, about 
about five yards out. Um, it was a good finish, in fairness to him. But yeah, that was the winner for PSG, who once again lumbered and bumbered their way through this game and probably should have won by more, but didn't. Uh, Leon got back to winning ways, winning away at Toulouse. Alexandre Lacazette with a brace in that game, a penalty and a, a terrific take for the uh, the winning goal. What proved to be the winning goal after Julian had headed to lose level. Uh, Raphael sent off the full Manchester United fullback in that game. Nancy got a much needed victory over Khan by two goals to nil. Mandan and Diara with the goals there. Uh, Lorient, managerless Lorient still, um, unfortunately. They uh, threw away a two-goal lead, standard. Two goals up through Toure. And uh, do you remember Sylvan Marvo, former Newcastle player? Yes. He, uh, he, got, he got the second. Um, Solomon Kamara right before halftime made it two to one and Morgan Samson who's a player you will hear a lot more if he stays fit this season he might actually feature in the hipster's choice at some point as well really talented player lovely goal for the equalizer 2-2 it finished there Bastia Dijon uh, that well it definitely didn't cut the mustard I'm sorry nil nil terrible game um point for each probably didn't deserve a point each to be honest it was that bad um and Ren Metz one nil to Ren with the winning winner coming from Said in that game and that's a good result for Ren and finally Marseille with Rudy Garcia everything's turning around it's really exciting it's great no it's nil nil with Bordeaux it was <laughs> wretched. I sat through this. It was a horrific game of football. So oh. uh, luckily I was watching Inter at the same time. But my God, this was a horrid game of football. Well, if you have seen the Sporting Heath on Granada game, it may have given that one a run for its money from the sounds of it. Um, it could have been as bad. Yeah. So do you want to give us a table then? How has it changed? Yeah. So as we said, Nice six points clear of both Monaco and PSG mm-hmm. top of the league. Uh, Gangob, as we said, in fourth. Ren quietly sneaking up. Rich Allen's boys there on uh, equal with Gangob on 20 points in fifth. To lose, dropping down the table, but they're still overachieving. Sixth, St Etienne, Lyon up to eighth. Bordeaux ninth. Marseille 10th, making up those top 10 positions. Uh, down at the bottom, Lorient, oh dear, bottom of the league, seven points now, 11 played. Need to get a manager fast. More on that briefly in a second. Nancy and Khan occupy the other two relegation spots. Lille, technically just outside on goal difference. Montpellier, Nantes, Bastia, Metz, Dijon and Angers make up the uh, the next half of the table. Fair play. Do you want to give us a fixture for next week? And you hinted there about a little bit of news. I did, very briefly. Uh, I'm very torn again on the fixture for next week. I kind of fancy Montpellier Marseille, but after my last two Marseille experiences, I'm not going to recommend that. So you watch that be five all now. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to go full hipster and go Metz St Etienne. Uh, on Sunday, PSG Ren is another one to keep an eye out, an eye out for Sunday night. But I fancy Metz and Etienne might have a few goals, um, and I'm quite intrigued to see how Metz do because at home they're pretty free flowing, pretty entertaining, and obviously we know how hard St Etienne are to beat. So that's my one. Very briefly, news uh, as we say, Lorient are searching for a manager. Um, there's talk that Hubert Fournier has met with the Lorient board. Um, also, that Remy Gard, who you might remember, um, he's apparently rejected the opportunity to uh, to join Lorient as their manager. And one of the final piece of news, um, Tommy touched on it earlier on in our WhatsApp group. Um, Leon today confirmed uh, via social <laughs> media that Mathieu Valbuena has not died. Um, <laughs> Mm. Not sure where these rumours came from, but social media was awash this morning that he had died. Um, however, the club basically were forced into action uh, to say that, um, no, he has not died. He is alive and well and, and all is fine. Um, his form has died, but he is very mm. much still alive. So, uh, yes. Uh, oh, one more bit of news for you, Tom. Um, a certain Mr. Serge Aurier might be pitching up at the new Camp next season. So is enjoy that. that. Right? Mm. Apparently yeah. Barcelona have had a little chat with him. So there you go. Interesting. Well, then you take back the reins and uh, we can go on to is it rest of the world next. Oh, it might be because we've got lots of news to pick up on from the rest of the world this week. So we can tease it no more. Let's take a trip to this week's best of the rest.
Okay, we are actually going to start this week. Now, don't worry, we are going to bring you up to speed with the MLS playoffs because uh, obviously our good friend Jimmy uh, and then Guna, he's written us a fantastic piece, uh, or brilliant piece of writing, actually. Two pieces, I should say. Let's not underpin it um, for the MLS playoffs, the predictions and whatnot. He was two for two after the first two games um, and then it got blown out of the water, as did his DC United. Whoops. Uh, more on them in a second. But we're going to start this week with a very quick roundup in Russia. Um, because we haven't given Russia any love this season. So just to bring you up to speed on how things are in Russia, Spartak Moscow are currently top in Russia, joint with Zenit St. Petersburg uh, on 28 points apiece. Zenit coming off a four-game winning run. Uh, CSK, Seska Moscow, whichever you prefer, they are currently in third, but seven points behind their rivals. Uh, Tarek Grozny also on the same, 21 points in fourth. Krasnodar in fifth, also the Europa League, of course. Um, Rostov, who... Uh, Drew will know from uh, Champions League and uh, up and coming team um, in uh, St. Griffith's PSV, I think. And they're in Athletico's group as well, aren't they, of course? Uh, they're seventh, currently on 17 points. Down at the bottom, oh, crikey, uh, Krylia Svetodos or Svitov. I think that's how you pronounce it. They're bottom, and they damn well should be with a name like that. Seven points. Uh, Tom Tomsk. That uh, should be your team, actually, Tom, that one. Eight points there, uh, also in the relegation zone. <laughs> Sounds brilliant. Arsenal Tula are just above the relegation zone, along with Ural and uh, Orenberg down there in 14th, 13th and 12th, respectively. Just to give you a little hint as to how things are going in the league this weekend, you might might or might not have known it was the Moscow derby. Sparta coming out 3-1 victors over Seska. Uh, two goals from Zay Luis in that game, a 3-1 victory. So uh, Spartak obviously went top with that result and they hold the bragging rights. Meanwhile, Zenit St. Petersburg were winning by a goal to nil. Uh, Mack with the winner there against Orenberg. So, oh, Slovakian. Indeed. So it's all close in Russia. Smolov is currently the top scorer in Russia. Eight goals for his Krasnodar side. Uh, Balai is uh, is close behind him for Terek and Giuliano, who's making a name for himself at Zenit, uh, as is Zuba, who you might remember for underperforming in the Euros, but he's very much the main man at Zenit. Um, and then as far as the assists go, there's one name out in front, or two names out in front, sorry. Uh, Oleg Shatov from Zenit St. Petersburg and Promise from uh, Spartak Moscow out there on the front. That with Quincy Promise. Uh, I believe it is actually. Yes, Ooh. I'm quickly scouting. It is indeed the, uh, the is, Netherlands yes. man. So he's, he's having awesome. he's been excellent. He's having a lovely time. He really is. He won't um, be there much longer. I, he'll go somewhere else. Oh, of course. But, yeah, money yeah. talks. We all know this. Um, right. Okay. Quickly, before we leave the rest of the world, then let's just quickly bring you up to speed on how things are going in the MLS. As I say, even if you haven't, even if you uh, are not a big fan of American soccer, uh, please do read Jimmy's um, work. He took an awful lot of time to get those previews up, and it's really good pieces of writing. So do give those a look on our website. So for those of you that don't know, we have a semi-finals lineup. It's Montreal Impact, New York Red Bulls, LA Galaxy, Colorado Rapids, New York City, Toronto, Seattle Sounders, Dallas. And the first legs have been played. Montreal coming out 1-0 victors over New York Red Bulls in the first leg. You would fancy New York will fancy their chances. Second leg, Mancuso got the winner. LA Galaxy also with a 1-0 win over Colorado, Giovanni Dos Santos. Yes, he's still alive. He's still going strong. He got the winner in that game. Again, the Rapids will fancy their chances at home, but I have a feeling Galaxy will somehow get through that one. Uh, TFC, Toronto, two late goals. Two goals in the last six minutes. Jose Altador. My house Sunderland could probably do with him right now. That says how bad Sunderland are. Uh, he got the first on 84 and Ricketts with the kind of clincher and key goal, I think, with uh, a minute to go. Patrick Vieira's face when that second goal went in was something to behold. Uh, David Villa's uh, team there, Tom, struggling for that second leg um, and speaking of struggling FC Dallas who of course won the um, Supporters Shield uh, just a week ago I think that's probably all they're going to be winning this season well that they did actually win the MLS Cup we should say as well but I think that's all they're going to be winning this season because they went down 3-0 at the Sounders Valdez and 2 for Ladero uh, coming out 3-0 victors there for Seattle However, I do remember Dallas doing an absolute crazy I don't know if we remember that this time Yeah, actually. I remember yeah, in that last minute, they got, was it two goals in the last minute in a game? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Absolutely nuts. So they're going to need something like that to come back in that game. The second legs are played this weekend on the 6th of November, uh, which in the UK is um, late, well, 
sort of Monday, uh, Sunday evening going into the early hours of Monday morning. Those four games are all back to back. So we will give you a quick update on who gets through in next week's podcast. So there you go. Right. That's our European roundup done for another week. Uh, before we leave you, of course, we've got your questions in a short moment. But before we get to that, let's take a dip into our bag of goodies. And it's this week's Hipster's Choice. Okay, we're actually going back into MLS for this, this week's Hipster's Choice because I've, uh, I've picked out a gentleman who uh, could well have a say in these playoffs and indeed he played for his team last night. This week's Hipster's Choice is Seattle Sounders, Jordan Morris. So what do we know about young Jordan Morris? Well, as I say, playing for Seattle Sounders in MLS, he is their number 13. He's also the USA's at number 8. He was born on October 26, 1994, making him 22 years of age. Uh, he was born on Mercer Island, which sounds like a wonderful place. I'm sure Drew will tell me it's not, but it sounds wonderful. Uh, that's in Washington, USA. He is 6 foot dead and 185 pounds right footed forward. He's a client of Nike. He wears a Superfly Iver boots. He is on Twitter at jmosmooth13 that's a great handle and j.morris13 on instagram if you wish to stalk him so what do we know well he was uh, born and grew up in the in the northeast of the u.s washington state where he played for local club uh, local club team and indeed his high school team uh, racking up state titles and numerous accolades he joined the seattle sounders youth academy for one season when he was in the senior high school and went on to play for stanford three seasons. During his time at Stanford, the Cardinals to be exact, Morris helped the team to their first PAC-12 championship in over 10 years. It was his sophomore year and both the PAC-12 and the NCAA championship as a junior. My, my, Drew, why can't they just have these things short to the league? Uh, he scored five of the team's 12 goals in the latter competition. While at Stanford, Morris spent some time playing for the Sounders under-23 team in the Premier Development League, that's more like it, generally considered to be the fourth tier of the competition in the USA behind the MLS, NASL and USL. See, I can deal with these short abbreviations, I'm fine with those. Um, Morris decided to forego his senior year in, in Stanford and signed with Seattle Sounders in MLS on January 21st, 2016 after turning down a contract with Drew Werder Bremen in the Bundesliga after a short trial. When Morris joined the Seattle Sounders earlier, <coughs> excuse me, earlier this year, he had big boots to fill. Um, outgoing striker Obafemi Martins, who scored 43 and 83 for the club, had left. And Morris, a native of Washington State, who went his senior year, as we mentioned before, and he helped the Cardinals to win the 2015 NCAA National Championship, scoring 23 goals in 54 appearances during his tenure. So much was expected. The 22-year-old since made his debut earlier this year and broke the rookie scoring record scoring in five consecutive games and he scored 12 goals and provided three assists in 35 this season he made his professional debut for seattle in the uh, concacaf champions league game against club america in february and scored his first mls goal for the sounders on april 16th against philadelphia union he then went up to score in the next three consecutive games marking a rookie sc- making sorry matching a rookie scoring record his next goal then surpassed the sounders rookie goal scoring record set by steve zaquani there's a name for the past in 2009 he scored 12 goals three assists and 35 this season as we said and uh, the team is leading as we mentioned briefly 3-0 after their victory over dallas so expect to see him a little bit more he was called up for the u.s men's national team in the friendly against czech republic in august 2014 making him only the second player to be called into the senior senior sorry making him the second player to be called into the senior squad while still playing at college level although he was actually left on the bench he would later debut later this year on april 15th 2015 he scored his first international goal against mexico just briefly his strengths and weaknesses he's a no-nonsense player he's got a single single mindset his pace is his main attribute and the ability to stand out because of it morris has a, a bit of a leaden right foot there were a few notice, notable times in stanford when he produced a thunderbolt strike or as we know it a thunder bastard Thank you, Ian McIntosh. Uh, from tight, uh, tight angles, from close in and around the box, and he much prefers to drive into the box with his sheer leg strength is almost inhuman under thighs. Uh, things he needs to improve on. 
definitely his left foot and his spatial awareness and technical ability in tight places. He was actually recognised by his coach at Stamford. He tried to develop him into more of an off the striker, off the shoulder striker, sorry, rather than somebody who ran at defenders. Something that he predicted correctly would not be so easy for him in the competitive leagues. And like some young strikers who have the tendency to dither, he does have the tendency to dither from the goal. Mor- Morris capitalises on chances. One of the reasons why he's eventually made it as a full-time forward at Stamford. Just two very interesting pieces of information before I pick on Drew on this one. Uh, Stanford is one of the most, or one of the top most competitive colleges and universities in the US, rivaling the Ivy League schools. Thus, it would conclude Morris is no dummy. Even athletes must meet the admis- admission requirements here. And here's a really interesting fact that I don't think a lot of people know. He's actually diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and has been since the age of 9 and is one of the few professional athletes with this illness to play. He said that the diabetes have, sorry, diabetes. He said that having diabetes has helped shape him. His tattoo T1D on his inner on his inner arm is a tribute to the armband people with diabetes have to wear. I think of all the hipster choices we've done, that's the most interesting fact um, I've ever come across. So our thanks to to Kelly Mayer for those uh, informational details. And she's provided me with, I have to say, a whole ton of information on the uh, US sort of collegiate soccer setup and coaching and all the different stages he's come through. So I might actually have to make that into a blog. But while we've got Drew, Drew, you do some work with regards to uh, these things. Um, Now, just give us a very brief bit of information about your thoughts on how the youth players are coming through these uh, these schools at soccer level and in, in America and, and how the coaching is improving to help them get to the stages where Jordan Morris, for example, has got to. Well, he's from Washington State, which is in the Pacific Northwest, not the Northeast, Chris, just to correct you real quick, because he said Northeast by accident. Sorry, my bad. Right. That's kind of read my wrong. <laughs> but no, it... Um, So states like Washington and Portland, um, amongst others, a lot of um, states in the Midwest, Illinois, uh, Indiana, Texas, for example, where Clint Dempsey is from, and then you know North Carolinas, New Jersey's. Those states are have always been um, football hotbeds in the United States. They've always historically produced better players, especially both men's and women's games. Look at the men's, uh, the women's national team. Rather, a lot of those players come from uh, California, Oregon, and. Uh, Washington State, it's just been it's easier to play the, that sport all year round in that climate, whereas in other parts of the country, people still care a lot about American football, baseball, basketball in, you know, in Portland and Northern California um, and Seattle, or Washington rather, it's really just football and baseball so they play all year round the kids growing up there so that he was already in an environment that put him on the right track to develop and going to Stanford, who are excellent academically, but also excellent from a collegiate uh, athletic standpoint, especially in football, um, getting the exposure he got with it for the uh, youth national team set up, um, getting into the, the, the door with the Sounders Youth Academy, which now a lot of MLS teams, actually all MLS teams now have youth academies, which they didn't used to have before when MLS first began. Focusing on youth development in the United States is exploding all over the country now, not just in those hotbeds, it's everywhere. Um, so he made the right choice by, yeah, I think he's almost in a way sort of paying back the opportunities that were afforded him by training here. And now he decided to stay in the MLS to develop because, you know, he did have a chance to go to Ritter Bremen, but honestly, he probably wouldn't have played very often for them. He would have been chucked out on loan quite a bit. Um, and that could have stagnated his development. And given the U S or in need for, other forwards who aren't Josie Altidore, and you know now that Clint Dempsey is on the verge of retiring soon, and you know Lenny Donovan is already since retired, you know the more Morris plays, the more likelihood it is that he will eventually lead the line along with Altidore in in the coming years. And I think he understood that, and you know that's a very interesting decision to make for someone who's only 22. So just a little bit of background for you on that. Good stuff. I like it. And and do you think, I mean, we've seen quite a lot of American players start to transition. And I'm watching Swansea right as we speak. Bob, Bob Bradley, of course, <laughs> the first coach to, to break through over here. But we've seen Bobby Wood minus his elbowing incidents of the weekend. Um, we've, we've seen a few that, that have, have come at Clint Dempsey, of course, is probably the biggest famous one, Brad Guzan. Um, Casey Keller, Yedlin, of course. Yes, they're all over the place. But Tim Howard. Do, do you, <laughs> Tim Howard, do you think that, 
you, you know the, the strikers are always the ones that get the lime like they're always the ones that light up um you, you know that they're, they're the ones that get the goals so they're the ones that are going to draw the most attention do you feel like morris has got the potential if he carries on at 22 to maybe make that move in, into into europe maybe in in a holland or a, a portugal somewhere where he's got the opportunity to flourish I think, yeah, I think he's got to go, if he is eventually going to go to Europe, it's, it's got to be a, a league where it's one step down from, from the top tier. So it, it can't be the Premier League, it can't be, you know, the Bundesliga or, you know, Spain or anything like that. It's got to be like a Belgium or a Netherlands, you know, that level. Still leagues and nations where they really focus on development and not just, you know, how much money you can spend to compete. It's about nurturing younger footballers. And still at the age of 22, I would still consider him a, a younger player, obviously. So, you know, he'll never be able to even work out at like an IX, for example. But you could see him even going to like a one of the, like a Gronigan level team, somewhere like that, you know, 20, as at Akmer, somewhere like that where he can, well, he'll play the majority of the league matches and really find a swing. That's what Altidore did, you know, and then he didn't, and same thing with, um, Aaron Johansson, both those players were very successful in the Netherlands, and then they tried to move on and try at the next level, see if they could work. You know, Johansson hasn't been great, and the Bundesliga out the door eventually had to come back to, oh, not back to, he had to come to them because he couldn't really, you know, he wasn't really great in the Premier League, you know, so, but as long as he makes the right steps, I think he'll put himself into a position by the age of, you know, say 25 to right before his prime to see if he has what it takes to maybe make a step up and Unlike the Bobby Wood scenario, where he made a massive jump from uh, Bundesliga's fine side to Hamburg, and you know, I think that, like I said before, that was maybe one big step too many. As long as you make those sort of, you know, those gradual increases and in testing your ability against better competition, I think that's that's the right way to go. So I think he made the right choice, and I think he'll probably still make the right choices based off of what he's already done so far. Yeah, we will watch his career with interest and uh, another one into the Hipsters Choice section of our website, which you can find uh, at, our, at our website, of course, the Football Hipsters Podcast dot co dot uk. Um, do do have a look at the uh, same of the blogs we've got up there. Don't forget, we've still got uh, as well as Jimmy's blogs. We've still got the uh, blog from Jake Bayliss. We've got another one of his to go up this week. So stay tuned for that. All about his love for Aston Villa. And this week uh, he was writing about his love for the Bundesliga, Drew. So that might be one for you to have a little yeah. uh, little tickle on as well um, and we're hoping to speak to Jay at some point in the future about um, about Villa uh, potentially on an interview so we'll see if we can set that up but yeah do have a look at the Hipsters Choice um, you can go back through the archive see the players we've picked out um, and Drew's excited because next week Drew we're, we're doing a player you know, might know a little bit about he's at Ajax Hakim Zayek um, or Zayech, whichever you prefer. So um, do tune in for that one next week. We will, of course, post links to some highlights for Jordan Morris tomorrow, and you can have a look at those. And uh, any questions you might have on, on Zayech, then uh, please do let us know. So Drew will be looking forward to that one. Right, OK, we will wrap the show up as we always do uh, with some questions. Uh, not many this week, so uh, we're going to have one from Tom to start with. But before we do, let's introduce the show it's this part. It's the onion bag. OK, then, Tom, do you want to start us off then? Uh, Valencia are level, I can tell you, first of all. Oh. So there you go, Rodrigo. Moreno I thought I should equalized. be happy or sad about that. I, I'm sort of disappointed no. in a way. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it, it, was, it was a terrible piece of goalkeeping to start it, but still. Yeah, well. um, right, you had a question. Was it a question for yeah, Drew? It was just, or a, just point a point, really. It was a hipster's point and something I didn't think we should ignore. I first checked, and it turns out it's Gooty's 40th birthday. Today, oh, the so, with the hair. Out. and then I went and checked, and there's a couple of other birthdays, and there's two that stood out. One because it's just he's just brilliant. Muzzy is it? It's his birthday. Brilliant, oh, Muzzy. <laughs> and then a certain Marco Van Basten turned 52 today as well. Is he? I've not heard of him. Yeah, mm. Dunga's birthday as well. Dunga, God bless him. God bless him. Well, there you go. So, famous birthdays. Right in. Give us your birthday. In fact, we should, actually. We should give people shout-outs for birthdays. We've never done that before. <laughs> God, we're turning into Radio 2. Anyway, uh, we've got three quick questions, then, which we're going to rattle through before we finish this week. Our first question, in fact, we've had two from one person, so we'll go with the other one first. Emmanuel Davilia, a regular listener, as he says, as uh, he or she, I think it's a he, 
As all of you are Arsenal fans, we've been outed, boys. Well, Ross isn't, but <sighs> the rest of us. Um, he wants to know how crucial Santi Cazorla is to the Arsenal team and who's your perfect replacement in the league. Uh, realistic, he says. Now, I don't want to turn this into an Arsenal podcast, boys, so I'm going to change this <laughs> question slightly. And I'm just going to ask you for one player from your respective leagues that you think closely resembles the Santi Cazorla role um, and, and just give some brief reasons as to why. So, uh, Tom, let's start with you. Oh. So, player in Spain, <laughs> and a deep-lying playmaker, I suppose. You would oh, no, it's easy. I can, I, can, I can answer okay. for Tom let's right see, now. Let's see if I can guess what I'm going to say. I'm going to say... Luka Modric. It's got to be Luka Modric. Oh, you're going to go Modric. I'm saying Gabby because I love Gabby. But... Oh, okay. We can have that, yeah. And um, what what does for those who've been living under a rock, what does Gabby bring to that that sort of position? Oh, okay, so Gabby is has never ever got a cap for Spain, which is criminal, and he's he's just a brilliant passer, calm on the ball, can bring a, a perfect tackle in, reads the game excellently, and he's just uh, he's pretty good on both feet, and he's just a wonderful, wonderful central midfielder that just encompasses the role in all its brilliant ways. But Modric is better. <laughs> uh, Drew, yeah. who have you got for us from the Bundesliga? That's, I hate this question. Also, you need to start giving us heads up. <laughs> oh no, that's, that's this is this is what tests you. I can answer mine if you want to have a little. No, bit no, I got it. I, I mean, I hate to say this. I'll probably in a pinch. I'll go with uh, Thiago and Katara. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. say that only because you know it, it's not the just because they're both Spanish. I feel like. He is as versatile as Santi. You know, Santi came to Arsenal as a left-sided player, then he transitioned to number 10, then he, now he's playing deep-lying playmaker in center mid. And these are all things that, you know, Thiago can do. He can play other positions other than in midfield. You know, he can play deeper. But, you know, the way that he can um, spread the play around, you know, he's excellent at, you know, uh, creating chances from deeper. He's very, very good on the ball. Um, I just think he's just, just a good all-around central player. And that's, I guess that's the only player I could really think of off the top of my head on short notice. Can you just Castro? Mm. Uh, no, I wouldn't Castro. say... I honestly wouldn't say Castro. I think Castro, for me, I think he is more suited to a more box-to-box role. Yeah. You know, um, and he's not as creative as you would like as you need to get from Santi because you know, Orla was close to what creating what three chances a match roughly in the same amount of key passes and that's more of what Tiago can bring mm. but Gonzalo Cascio can he can run the midfield from a more also physical, physical standpoint he'll also pick the ball he'll also run with it you know he's just always back and forth I think Tiago is just more of that that sort of mid- midfield fulcrum sort of pivot that you would want that that's play, play will you know floor around so I like it. I like it. I suppose I better answer this one as well. Um, it's difficult. I think Corentin Tolisso at Leon is is a mm. shout if he continues to progress as he has. Um, he's nowhere near as creative as, as Santi, but he's got that style of play. Likes to create from deep. Um, I personally think Nabil Fakir could play that role, but at the moment he's obviously more of a ten or or a wide forward, so I can't really put him in. The one I'm actually going to plump for is not hipster at all, but both in stature and in the way he plays and uses the ball. Marathi, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, just everything about him, you know, quick feet, ability to, to break the lines as well as, as find the killer pass. Technically brilliant, but good on both feet. Um, has a bit of a temper, unlike Santi, I would say. But um, no, he's, he's a gifted, gifted footballer. And uh, I think, I, I don't think Marathi will be at PSG longer than two years. I know he signed a new contract recently. I think that was more to get his value up. So uh, I can see him in Barcelona or Real Madrid's midfield, particularly what Modric now 29. Uh, Tony Cruz is getting on a bit as well, isn't he? So I could see Verratti in, in that Real Madrid midfield um, in the coming years. So uh, listen back to this episode in two years and see if I'm right, but he, he's good enough. Or maybe even Tom, maybe even a shout if, if, um, Iniesta's obviously on on his on his sort of uh, swan song years. Yeah, I wonder because um, I don't think Arda Turan is as good no. as he is. He's not the same no. type of player as he. So no, yeah, 
I think Verratti might might uh, might have the son of Spain on his back at some point. So, although he, he said would... he wants to stay until PSG win the Champions League, didn't he say something like that? Oh, he says a lot of things, as do a lot of footballers. <laughs> uh, but I, I, yeah, I think money talks. And if you saw his reaction to being subbed of the week, you'll you'll know what I mean. I don't mm. think all is well with Emery there personally. We shall see. Um, right, our other question we had two questions from the same person, Tom, who's a new follower. I haven't seen this name before. Uh, Tom, you've got an egg. You need a picture. Get a picture up there, my friend. Uh, he's at Five Star Flips. It's a great handle, actually. Um, two questions. Then we'll wrap up with these. Um, he says English teams always seem to always seem to end up paying way more money for average players. And the link to his question is. Out of all of the leagues you cover, who do you think does the best transfer business in terms of spotting young talent? I think that's a brilliant question. Yes. Um, who's who? Let's go reverse order. Drew, have you got a team that 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 pulls out the, the best transfer business in terms of young talent in Germany? I suppose Dortmund's the obvious one, but anyone else? Ah, uh, oh man, that is a good one. Uh, I don't know. Um, let me see. I'm in general, I'd say Germany's the best. That's it. Yeah. As a, in regards to a league, yeah, I would say so. Um, just the way they, you know, there's been so much documentation about how they completely revamped the entire setup for developing players countrywide. I think that's why Germany developed so many good players. Um, I would say Dortmund's excellent. At, I, mean, I can't really pinpoint one. A lot of, there's a lot of teams in Germany that will not just look in in the lower leagues or, you know, have players come through their own ranks, but they can look elsewhere. You know, they might go to Belgium or the Netherlands. Sometimes they go to Eastern Europe. There's a, there's a, a lot of brilliant, technically good young players in like Croatia, Serbia, for example. We all know that, especially with, you know, clubs like, you know, Dinamo Zagreb and such. So um, I can't really pick just one, but, you know, Dortmund's one of, I would say, maybe five, six or seven clubs that can really look for a good young player and bring them in and then not just bring them in you know, just to spend the money, but bring them in and give them a fair amount of responsibility starting from their first season and really to develop them after that. That's the most important point. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Tom, have you got an answer from La Liga? Yeah, I mean, the obvious one is Atletico. Uh, I mean, you look at Saul and you look at Jimenez, you look at uh, Hernandez, uh, and you look at what they've brought in, in the past, of bringing in players like Vieto, now on Sevilla on loan. Last season, I brought in a guy called Diego Yota, who's on loan at Porto and having an excellent season. Um, so they're the obvious choice. But Spain, in general, is brilliant for looking and bringing in talent, not just from their own country, from abroad. Espanol good at bringing players on loan. Valencia been good at the past, but the likes of Zakaria Bacali uh, coming in from PSV, and then um, Santi Mina obviously was brought in from Celta Vigo, who are another team you can also argue are good at bringing in youth. So Spain, in general, is brilliant for for bringing up youth. But I do side with Drew on the side of Germany. I think Germany is the the best league in general of bringing spotting talent and and developing it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think um, France is a nightmare to answer for this question. I, I think genuinely, and I know I'm a bit biased, obviously, I genuinely think France right now is the best league as far as bringing through youth players um, and, and sending them off to, to big clubs. If you look mm. at the amount of young talents come out of France, whether they've all been to the level that they should have been, I don't know. That's, that's a, I'll argue for another day. But I genuinely think France has got some of the best young talent in, in Europe right now. But as far as the actual question yeah. goes, I mean, there's there's probably three answers quickly. Lorient, I actually think, are one of the best-run clubs business-wise in France. They're run by businessmen. Um, they get young players, they sell them high, um, and they bring other players back and then build them up. Gamero is a good example, Tom, that you mentioned earlier. Um I think Lyon have got one of the best academies along with Nice for young players coming through. Um, so many players have come through those two academies. It's, it's incredible. And should mention the, the Lyon women's team as well. The, some, of the, some of the best female footballers in the world just come out of Lyon's academy. Um, and then this, this one might shock you, but I think also there is a combined business model. Um, I have to say Monaco at the moment. And I know that's a really weird one to pull out because of all the whatnot they went through with um, their their owner, Reba Lovlev, uh, going through his divorce and it all coming out. And I know that they, they bought their way to where they are. But if you take away the first two seasons, now what they're doing, look at the business they've done this year and the players they've shipped out for big money and the, you know, the money they've got for Falcao on loan, for goodness sake. Um, you know, they have done some brilliant business. So it's a bit of a left field argument, but 
um, they would be the ones I'd pick out. So it's a really, really good question um, and a question worthy of you getting a picture instead of an egg, Tom. So please, please get yourself a picture <laughs> and let us know who you follow, because that that strikes me as a question of a man who who follows his football. So do let us know. It's got a great right. name. It, yeah, indeed, absolutely. It's, it's a wonderful name. <laughs> Not quite as good as Chris, but it is a good name. Uh, anyway, <laughs> before we go, uh, before we go, very quickly, Tom, you took mm. part in something this week, and Ross has got some news this week, which we'll announce on the English Breakfast, but you were part of a TV appearance this week. Do you want to tell people about that? Yes, I was. Uh, I was asked very kindly by the people of Fan TV to go on and, go and talk about Arsenal. But they, and I was not aware of this, allowed me to talk about the hipsters a lot. Um, they actually were quite disappointed by lack of length of beard and, and long hair and, and glasses. That was disappointing. And I said I'd work on it, but I may have lied because the missus, as I said on the show, would probably kill me if I if I did that. No no offence to you, Chris. It's just it's not to her taste. Um, but oh, uh, no, uh, they were fantastic. It was, it was great to go on. It was great to chat about Arsenal. It was great to chat about European football. I may have put the slight thing about my La Liga thing, but uh, we'll leave that there. And no, it was just great, and they were very nice about it. So, um, yeah, a big up to, to Fan TV. Go check them out. They're on Channel uh, Sky 212, which is Showcase, and you can see them on YouTube and, and Facebook and Twitter. So, yeah. Splendid. Lovely job. Okay, super. Um, right, well, I think that will do us for this week, then. Uh, I think we've done well in, in John's, abs- John's absence to uh, to cover everything this week. Um, we will, of course, be back next week. Uh, just a very, very quick plug for our various bits and bobs. We do do this podcast for free. If you do want to make donations to our podcast for upkeep and whatnot, we do have a GoFund... Is it Go? I think it's GoFundMe page. Thank you. Uh, that's drew set it up didn't you drew thank you very much for your time doing that um, go find me yes <laughs> thank you thank god for that it would help if i have got the right name wouldn't it um but yeah if you've got a few pennies feel free and uh, if you haven't got a few pennies why not why, why not if i can put my teeth in write us a review um you can do that on itunes the more reviews we get the more five star ratings we get uh the more exposure the podcast gets and, and the more listeners we get we don't do this for for the money we do it for the enjoyment and um we like to hear from you guys and girls of course you know let us know who do you support what leagues do you follow what sort of things do you want us to discuss anything you want us to bring up any hipsters choices you might want to talk about all these things help us so leave us some feedback and uh, and if you listen on soundcloud uh, do hit the subscribe button or indeed on youtube give us a thumbs up so we really appreciate that and thank you as always you can interact with us uh, at the fh podcast if you want to write a blog or just give us uh, some thumbs up or or if you want to tell us we're awful that's fine we don't mind um we'll just ignore you it's all good right uh, that will do us for another week then uh, my thanks to tom and to drew thank you gentlemen no, no, no problem, problem. <laughs> I thought you'd both run away for a minute. Um, <laughs> and uh, in, John's, uh, in John's absence, thank you to John. We wish him well. Uh, you will also be able to hear the English Breakfast podcast, which will be released a little bit before this one. So do check that out if you haven't already. Uh, we'll speak to you next week. But until then, keep your beard strong and your glasses trendy. We have been the Football Hipsters. Enjoy your football, and we'll speak to you next week. <laughs> <laughs>